Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RIA Now update. We're going to give it just a couple moments for everyone to filter on in and settle. Let everyone be admitted. Give us just a second. Well, as they keep entering in, I wanted to say um, an, a little bit early happy holidays. Thanks so much for being with us. I know it's a crazy busy time of year. So the fact that you came and shared your um, afternoon with us today is um, really wonderful and shows your commitment to us and to the industry and, and to uh, your own path to success. So thank you so much for being here. We're excited about it. Um, today, I'm, I am... Um, not just as a uh, as the presenter and, and coming coming from the company side, but as an investor myself, excited about this presentation uh, because there's so much that I don't know that I want to know. And Adam is the man for the job. He will uh, give us such a great overview and and uh, outlook on where we're going with digital assets. And we're going to cover kind of the, a wide range of things. Adam has a ton of experience. I'll give you three small things to point out in his very large breadth of experience that he'll talk about. But right now, he's president and founder of CProp.io, which is a real estate exchange for digital asset security tokens. He's also president and founder of Reversed Out, a creative technology branding company. And he's the owner operator of Coveworks, which is a co-working space in my very own Covington, Kentucky. So um, both uh, hometown close to the heart and, and a subject that's becoming closer and closer to my heart. So I'm super excited about having him um, talk to us today. That being said, I am going to give our disclaimer because this is very much a finance topic. And we want to make sure that you check with your own advisors, with your own CPA, with your own um, attorney, if you have any questions in terms of legal questions or financial questions. Everything today is just informational. None of us are uh, recommending anything or giving you financial advice. It is an overview and information on the subject. We are here to promote, protect, and educate. We've been doing so for about 35 years as National RIA, and we have uh, local associations that serve you at the local level. We want to thank you so much for being here and for being part of your local RIA. As being part of your local RIA, we um, also have some great benefits that we can share through our sponsors like the Home Depot Pro. They've sponsored this broadcast for the last two years now, and they are a terrific sponsor of us as an organization. They have a special program for investors that's just through our association for the uh, special goodies that you get, including discounts like 20% off paint, a rebate program, and there are some other exclusive programs that we have, like a uh, cabinet program and an appliance program. So if you have questions about that, you can reach out to your local association join them and have access to those programs. So if you're curious about finding your local RIA, you can do so by coming to our website, clicking I'm an investor, and then clicking the find a local RIA button. Any updates that we're doing on any last of the COVID, uh, and I'm hoping this is going to be the last time I'm going to have to say this for a while, any of the last of the COVID-19 information is right there in that button uh, at the top. This is a picture of why I felt like it is time. We've talked about uh, Bitcoin on several of our, our last cruises and, and crypto in general and digital assets. We've talked about it on cruises. We've talked about it other places. And when I saw this, I knew it was time to bring it to the, to the general uh, group for a discussion. This particular machine, you can buy Bitcoin here, is in a hole in the wall liquor store in Newport, Kentucky. Uh, so if we've made it to that much mainstream, then uh, there's not just a few questions that we do get. Uh, many of you have emailed me and said, when can we cover this topic? But now that I know it's this, this ubiquitous, this is everywhere, it was time to jump on in. And like I said, Adam's the man for the job. Also to let you uh, know, we have covered lots of this. Brad has been on top of it 
gotten several things out there as time has gone on. But I want to point out on real estate investing today, there are a few articles now. Um, this is the uh, infographic he put up, I think, last week, two weeks ago. Uh, that is a great infographic on there. So you can click through. Lori will put that in the chat as the address there. There's also an article, Understanding the Super Basics of Bitcoin. And there's also, uh, Brad mentioned to me today, and I, I read the Wall Street Journal had a terrific article on uh, digital assets as well today. So it's definitely the hot topic of the moment. And Adam, we're so thankful that you're here to share with us today. I can't wait to hear what you're going to tell us about the future with crypto. Perfect. Well, thanks for the intro. And uh, yeah, everybody, I'm uh, Adam Kaler. So uh, if anybody's familiar with Dot Loop, which I'm guessing most of you are outside of the stuff that uh, Rebecca listed there, I'm also uh, one of the co-founders of Dot Loop. So uh, if you guys know Austin Allison, it was his ID, started the company, brought me and a buddy, Matt Vorston, and I was the designer marketer for it. And Matt was the uh, developer and we pretty much cranked away for a year and a half on building out our little prototype before it, uh, before it kind of blew up and, uh, yeah, so we, we've kind of been ahead of, uh, you know, I pride myself in trying to stay ahead of things, especially in, in the real estate world, which is where most of my experience is. I'm also an investor. Uh, I've been buying rental properties for 20 years now, uh, and, you know, regular tenants, section eight tenants, you name it. So, you know, I felt most of your pain, uh, as a, as a landlord as well. So, uh, today I think we're going to talk a little bit about the, the basics of, of this digital, uh, world that we're moving into. And uh, I've been buying and selling crypto for, you know, since 2015. Uh, when we sold Dot Loop, um, I got a check and I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I'm just some poor kid from the west side of Cincinnati. You know, what do I do with all this money? And uh, I asked my broker at Fidelity, I said, what about Bitcoin? What if I put some of this in Bitcoin? Oh, no, 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 no. Don't do that. You know, it's too volatile. Bitcoin was like $400, I believe at the time, if I can remember. So uh, I put a little bit in anyway. I didn't put a whole bunch in, but come to find out years later, Fidelity had been mining Bitcoin and Ethereum since 2015. So my broker didn't know, but the company sure knew, and they knew the direction this was headed, I think. And it's starting to develop as its own asset class. So things that, you know, you, you want to invest in gold, you want to invest in silver. Well, the younger generations now, you know, gold and silver is a hedge to inflation, which is, you know, what we're dealing with right now. Um, they're not as interested in gold and silver. They're interested in digital assets. They're interested in cryptocurrency. Uh, they're interested in the metaverse. They're interested in buying digital land. So, you know, as a hedge to inflation, a lot of these dollars are starting to move into the crypto space. And you could see that with the, uh, the current market cap being at around, I think, $2.2 trillion right now. So, um, We'll just go through a little bit of basics. So the blockchain, um, if, if everybody's, I'm guessing not everybody on, on the call right now is familiar with blockchain technology in general. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just go through, you know, what it says on, on Wikipedia here and then explain it a little bit. So blockchain is a system of recording information in a way that makes it difficult or impossible to change, hack or cheat the system. A blockchain is essentially a digital ledger of transaction that is duplicated and distributed across the entire network of computer systems on the blockchain. So there is no centralized authority. There's no bank. There's nobody in charge of a blockchain, uh, unless you have a private blockchain. That's the, that's, that's the one caveat there. But in general, when you talk about a blockchain, and the most famous blockchain would be Bitcoin, and no, Bitcoin is not blockchain, and blockchain is not Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an application that's built using blockchain technology. And essentially, it's just a big ledger. It's a spreadsheet of transactions. So if, if Rebecca and I wanted to do a Bitcoin transaction, there's 75 million computers that sit on, that make up the Bitcoin network and, or make up the Bitcoin blockchain. And those computers are constantly mining, which means they're looking for transactions to solve. And they are the ones that look at my wallet and say, hey, does Adam have this much Bitcoin that he can send Rebecca? Oh, it looks like he does. Let's go ahead and put that forward. What do the rest of you think? And then you have to get 51% consensus on the entire network, which means over 35 million computers need to agree that that transaction 
should go through and then it gets processed and it goes through. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of how the blockchain works. So now cryptocurrencies. Just mentioned Bitcoin as one cryptocurrency, but there's thousands of cryptocurrencies out there. So cryptocurrencies use blockchain technology to let users make secure payments and store money without the need to use their name or go through a bank. So it can be anonymous. It can be tracked. I know that question's coming. Oh, well, what about you know drug dealers and all this and that? It can be tracked. It's an open public ledger. So if there's any on-ramps or on-ramps to where the money came from, easily tracked. Um, they run on a distributed public ledger called a blockchain, which is a record of all transactions updated and held by currency holders. So I talked about this a little bit. Mining, all 75 million of those computers on the Bitcoin network are known as miners. And you could have a facility with thousands and thousands of these machines. Right now, I have six ASIC miners and like three uh, rigs of GPU miners mining two different cryptocurrencies upstairs for me right now. And the ASIC miners are mining Litecoin, which is probably the third uh, most traded cryptocurrency, and Ethereum, which is the second most traded cryptocurrency. And I've just got these machines mining upstairs, and they're, you know, it's a small little operation, but it's making about $70 a day and I'm doing nothing. So mining, I'm part of those networks. So I'm one of the validators on those networks. And I pull my hash power, which is how much power my computers have. I pull that power in with a bunch of other validators on the network. So we have a higher probability of mining transactions. So crypto mining refers to the process of gaining cryptocurrency by solving a cryptographic equation with the use of high-powered computers. The solving process comprises uh, verifying data blocks and adding transaction records to a public record known as a blockchain. So in Bitcoin's case, you're creating blocks and then you're submitting those onto the chain and then a new block is created. So all a block is, is a block of information. And in Bitcoin's case, that block is one megabyte. So, so many transactions can go into that block in 10 minutes. And every 10 minutes, that block is then submitted to the chain and a next block is created. And then another one megabyte of transactions. So all of the computers, all 75 million of computers on the Bitcoin network are fighting over submitting that block to the chain. Because if you submit that block to the chain, you get new Bitcoin. So new Bitcoin is created and given to the validators that get that win those transactions. And that's how people make money mining cryptocurrency. And that's how the network keeps going. So buying cryptocurrency. I'm guessing, you know, some of the people on here, I mean, we're all investors. We're all interested in making money. I'm sure, you know, a good chunk of you guys already know how to buy cryptocurrency. But if not, if you want to buy cryptocurrencies, you're going to need a wallet. So an online app that can hold your currency, generally you create an account on an exchange. And then you can transfer real money to buy cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. So the most popular exchange probably in the United States is Coinbase. So you could go to Coinbase and you could download their app. It's free. Connect your bank account. And then there's a, a list of all of the cryptocurrencies that trade on Coinbase that you can purchase. And it's the same with Gemini. And that's probably the next most popular in the United States. And then there's some offshore uh, where you can buy uh, not as popular cryptocurrencies, but very profitable if you were wanting to go in and trade them. Uh, there's some coins that don't trade on Coinbase and Gemini because of regulation purposes, um, but that's Binance.us, which is based, I think, in Singapore now. They keep moving around, um, but they're based in Singapore now, and a lot of people, if they want to buy kind of suspect coins, they go on, on Binance. I wouldn't necessarily recommend buying them there. I'd stick to Coinbase and Gemini most likely. But those two exchanges are the most popular and they're regulated and you know, Coinbase is publicly traded and, and Gemini has a, a banking license in the state of New York. So they've gone through all the processes to try to make sure you don't lose your money. And this is very a very scary thing to get into. It's not as necessarily secure as some of the older ways to to purchase securities like a Fidelity or you know Schwab or whatever you purchase currencies through right now. 
So there are some downsides. So here we go. NFTs. Everybody's probably heard this hype around non-fungible tokens. Well, a non-fungible token is a unique and non-interchangeable unit of data stored on a digital ledger blockchain. NFTs can be associated with reproducible digital files, such as photos, videos, and audio. NFTs use a digital ledger to provide a public certificate of authenticity or proof of ownership, but it does not restrict the sharing or copying of underlying digital file. And then the lack of interchangeability, fungibility, distinguishes NFTs from blockchain cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. So the one cryptocurrency I mine upstairs, Ethereum, it kind of changed the game because the one you know, use case for cryptocurrency was block, was Bitcoin for a while. And all it is is an exchange of value. It's just a cryptocurrency that goes back and forth. People can change it. It's almost like money, right? But people use it as a store of value because it just keeps going up in value. But Ethereum came out. And what Ethereum did is it added an additional layer to that transaction. So if Rebecca and I, back to my example, Rebecca and I want to do a Bitcoin transaction. I send her Bitcoin. She accepts a Bitcoin. My Bitcoin's gone. But now what if you put a smart contract, which is what Ethereum did, in between that transaction? So in order for Rebecca to get my money, a smart contract holds whatever I send until Rebecca does what she says she's going to do. So think of it as a, a digital escrow. So until a, a transaction is done, until I get my NFT, she doesn't get her money. So that's what Ethereum did. And that kind of changed the game because now you can start seeing how it's going to disrupt industries like legal, maybe title, right? Rebecca and I talked a little bit before here about what if land titles were on a blockchain and blockchains are immutable. Once a transaction goes through, it can't be changed unless you somehow are able to hack the 75 million computers on the Bitcoin network all at the exact same time, which is pretty much impossible. But in, say, Title's case, there's 7,000 municipalities in the United States, some 7,000 something. If you could get them all to run as a node, run as a, like a miner on the network, that's a lot of computers. That's a lot of systems. 7,000 is a, is a good amount of computers to run a secure blockchain. You could essentially, every time a piece of property switches hands, they would validate that transaction. And you would have an open ledger of every transaction, every land title on it. It's the same with NFTs. If I create a metaverse, this, this video game that people are, that kids right now are going into and some adults, and you know they're running around the metaverse playing their game, I could buy land, open up a digital store, and create digital things that people need to play the game. Maybe it's a sword, maybe it's a suit of armor, maybe it's a horse that I ride on or whatever. That's why people are purchasing land in these popular video games right now. And the land is essentially titled as an NFT. And once someone purchases that, it can't be taken away. There's information on a public ledger that Rebecca owns a 12 by 12 plot of land in a game called Decentraland. And she paid $22,000 dollars for that. So if you look at some recent articles that came out, this is from The Motley Fool. And this, uh, this Christy lady, she's been actually producing a lot of really good content about the metaverse and digital land. But almost 25% of NFT purchases in early December were for digital land, just for digital land. Uh, millennials and Gen Z are planning to spend thousands on cryptocurrency, NFTs, and metaverse land as holiday gifts. So you don't even have to go to the store anymore, guys. You just buy some digital land and, and, and gift that to people. And then the plot of digital land just sold for $32,000 in the sandbox. So sandbox is probably the second most popular. And you can actually buy a cryptocurrency um, associated with these games inside of uh, Gemini or Coinbase. Um, I, think, I think they sell on in, in both of those platforms. Um, but uh, there's this, this game called Sandbox. And there's another game. Um, called Decentraland. And those are the two big ones right now. And Decentraland is probably doing the most transactions right now. And then Sandbox is number two right now. But both of these, you, can, you don't even have to buy the land. You can essentially buy the token. And if the games do well, the token value should theoretically go up over time. 
But this isn't even that expensive. $32,200 must have been a small plot of land. I think it's represented by this tiny orange square right here. There's other people that have been purchasing land for well over a million dollars. And generally, if you want to purchase land in one of these metaverses, you would have to use Ethereum or maybe Bitcoin. So you would have to convert your US dollars into one of those cryptocurrencies and purchase the land. But then later on, you could purchase things to build. You know, you can, you can create a mall if you wanted to in one of these digital games. So really interesting. So why the hype? Outside of just, um, outside of just you know, metaverse or whatever, uh, the supporters of cryptocurrency, and these are some devout people. I mean, cryptocurrency for a lot of these people is, is, is almost like a religion. And I've been kind of deep in it for you know, several years now. And a lot of times what you'll see is uh, Discord, which is like a gaming uh, chat application. You see a lot of these cryptocurrency projects, very popular, and they create their own Discord channels and people go in there and talk about them. Uh, Twitter's very popular. So if you typed you know, NFT in Twitter, you could start to see some of the most popular people who are influencing uh, the crypto space right now when it comes to NFTs and follow them and try to hunt down the next really cool crypto project that's coming out. Um, that's a really good, that's a pretty easy way to do it. But supporters see cryptocurrency like Bitcoin as the currency of the future and are racing to buy them now, presumably before they become more valuable. And they will become more valuable, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion. Because the thing about Bitcoin, let's just talk about Bitcoin right now. There are 21 million Bitcoin that will ever exist, and they won't be done mining until the year 2100. So in our lifetimes, they're still going to be mining Bitcoin. And when you have a fixed supply of anything, if there's enough branding behind it and enough, of people, enough people agree that it is money, then you're going to get adoption and hopefully hold its value as whatever that is that you think it's worth. So if you've got 21 million Bitcoin, right now at this moment, only about 18 million have ever, ever been mined. I believe a, an article came out said 90% of the Bitcoin has already been mined and it gets harder and harder over time. So 90% of the Bitcoin in 13 years has been mined. It's going to take another 100 years to mine the rest of it because it just keeps getting more and more difficult. But there's only 18 million that have ever been mined. About 6 million, and this is a conservative estimate, about 6 million are lost forever. Because people in the early days, they lost their hard drive they were mining Bitcoin on. Maybe it was a, a backup hard drive, or maybe it was their computer that they threw away or whatever. So take those out of the equation. Say there's only 12 million Bitcoin in circulation right now that can be traded. There's 56 million millionaires in the world. So there's not enough Bitcoin available right now for every millionaire to have a quarter of a Bitcoin. And you don't have to buy one Bitcoin. It's divisible by 18 digits. So you can buy a small percentage of Bitcoin. You could buy dollars worth of Bitcoin if you wanted to. So there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I don't have enough money to buy Bitcoin. It's $60,000. Well, it's $47,000 right now. I don't have enough money to buy it. You don't have to buy one Bitcoin. You could buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin every day if you wanted to. You could, you could set up your Coinbase account to purchase $100 worth of Bitcoin every month, whatever you want to do. But the fact that it's a fixed asset, we don't know how much gold there is in the world. We don't know how much silver there is in the world. There might be an asteroid floating around there in the Kuiper belt that they wrangle in one of these days. Elon Musk goes out and gets it. It's full of gold. We don't know. There could be a planet made of diamond that we don't know about yet that's out there floating around. So we know how much Bitcoin there's going to be. And Bitcoin doesn't care what country you come from. It doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care what monetary policy does. Bitcoin is its own thing. Bitcoin is like a universal currency anybody can use anywhere in the world. If I go to Mexico right now, I just got to remember in my head my private key, and I can access my Bitcoin on the other side of the border if I wanted to. So some supporters like the fact that crypt cryptocurrency removes central banks from managing their money supply. What are the central banks doing to our money supply right now? Adding to the money supply, increasing inflation. Um, since over time, these banks tend to reduce the value of money via inflation. Think about if you lived in Argentina, the Argentinian peso. Just go look up US dollar versus Argentinian peso. Fell off a cliff. If you were holding money in Argentinian pesos, you'd be miserable. If, if you've been holding that as retirement, because it just continues to drop and inflation continues to go up in their country because of hyperinflation. These are the type of things that the Bitcoin crypto community is interested in. 
And we as Americans are pretty spoiled because we live in America. Every other currency on earth is based on the value of our currency. So to us, a dollar is a dollar and it never changes. That's not the case in other countries. So a lot of the people who are interested in cryptocurrency live in some of these countries and they have crazy people as dictator leaders and they screw up their financial system. Look at Turkey right now. Turkey's dealing with hyperinflation. So other supporters like the technology behind cryptocurrencies, the blockchain, because it's decentralized processing and recording system and can be more secure than the traditional payment systems, which 100% is. There's no human involvement. Uh, some speculators like cryptocurrency because they're going up in value and have no interest in the currency's long-term acceptance as a way to move money. So there are some issues. There's government regulation. If anybody wants to get on YouTube right now, you can see a whole bunch of people that are influencers in the crypto space. Uh, mostly people that own exchanges or are CEOs of exchanges or the CFOs of exchanges sitting in front of Congress right now answering a bunch of questions by a bunch of people who know nothing about technology. Um, so that's one issue that that is out here, but there's no way for the government to shut Bitcoin down. If anybody's like, well, they could just shut it down. They can't. You'd have to shut down 75 million computers around the entire world, and that's not going to happen without just shutting the internet down. So good luck, government. Um, inheritance, um, you know, that's an issue. I mean, when you start talking about wealth taxes and things like that, Bitcoin transactions can be, um, they can be taxed. So, you know, pay your taxes. Uh, security, um, security could be an issue. If your phone gets simmed, someone could literally uh, go down to Verizon or uh, AT&T and say, oh, I lost my cell phone and fake your ID. And they give them a new uh, cell phone with your SIM card and they open it up and boom, there's all your information. And they could just steal your crypto if they wanted to. Um, so make sure you got good security at whatever cell phone provider you have if you decide to start buying cryptocurrencies. Um, market volatility is always an issue. You have these big ups and downs. I'm thinking you know, pretty soon here, we, we may start seeing, if you look at the technicals, we're probably in a head and shoulders pattern right now. Once that right shoulder forms, we're probably going to maybe potentially see some downside depending on what happens here. But uh, we could you know, potentially go back down to $20,000. Um, that's the next big support region. So, um, you know, you just gotta, gotta be okay with market volatility, but then you just buy more. That's generally what happens. Um, the speed, um, because blockchains require validation and in Bitcoin's case, 75 million computers, um, you're gonna have speed issues. It's not gonna be as fast and uh, you can't process as many transactions per second as you could on say Visa's network. So uh, those problems are being resolved. There's tons of open source developers working on things like the Lightning Network for Bitcoin. You could look that up if you guys are interested. Um, and then adoption in general. I don't think we have a problem with adoption right now. I think you know Bitcoin has become the Kleenex of cryptocurrencies um, and uh, there's a huge brand and you've got a lot of the newer generation people that are very interested in this. And uh, it's Web 3.0, guys. Web 2.0 uh, is what we're dealing with right now. You know, Web 1.0 was uh, you couldn't interact with the websites really that you were going to look at. You just kind of opened up a browser and there was a website giving you information. And Web 2.0 was more of an interactive experience where Web 3.0 may be a decentralized internet. Everything on Web 2.0 or up to, the, up to this moment in the internet has been centralized. So there's one computer that your website lives on. And if that gets hacked, the website goes down. Well, with the decentralized internet, your computer or your website could potentially live on thousands of computers, thousands of servers, all working together to, to show your website. So if they hack one computer, they, they, your website doesn't go down. So that's essentially like the decentralized internet. So the future, crypto may provide access to a new demographic or new demographic groups. Totally is. It's happening right now. There's no doubt about it. Positions a company in this emerging space. So, you know, you say, hey, we're blockchain, blah, blah, blah. Then all of a sudden you get attention. And uh, if anybody ever wanted, you know, you got a company, you want to go public, you know, now it's cool to do a SPAC or whatever, but you're like blockchain, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden people throw money at it. Um, enable access to new capital and liquidity pools through traditional investments that have been tokenized as well as new asset classes, which is one of the things we're doing with CProp, helping people obtain liquidity from their commercial real estate without having to technically go through the process of finding investors and selling, um, selling their property, uh, the traditional route. Uh, programmable money that can enable real-time and accurate revenue sharing while enhancing transparency to facilitate back office reconciliation. Accountants love crypto. 
it's it's reconciled in real time. There's no end of year reconciliation. As soon as a transaction goes through, it's on the ledger. It's taken out of one account. It's put into another account. It's beautiful. Get positioned to receive and um, disperse crypto to assure smooth transactions with key stakeholders. I'll run through these. Enable simple real-time and secure money transfers. And then crypto may serve as an effective alternative or balancing asset to cash, which may depreciate over time due to inflation. And if anybody's ever gone out of the country and tried to take some money out of an ATM through, from your bank account, you're going to get hit with fees, uh, conversion fees. You go down to the bank and you say, hey, can I get some euros before my trip? They say, sure, give me $100 and I'll give you $90 worth of euros or whatever. So you've got conversion problems. With crypto in the future, you're not going to deal with that anymore. So anyway, I rushed through that. I wanted to leave some time. Um, it's 4.32 right now. I think we got some time for questions. So Adam, one of the, um, for those who don't understand kind of what's happening in, in the metaverse, uh, we do have some questions about what value does someone get if they purchase digital land? So it's really about the game. Really what you're doing is you're purchasing land in a game, um, which everybody saw Facebook change their name to Meta, right? Facebook's ahead of it, right? Facebook also tried to have a cryptocurrency called Libra. And that got shot down by the government. Um, but the idea is, is that you've got kids that are, I mean, there's people on here with kids. How, much, how many video games do your, do your kids play, right? Do they go outside or do they play video games? They play video games. So while they're in the game, they're essentially in this you know, virtual world. And the more and more virtual reality becomes a thing, the more they're going to be in this metaverse, right? This alternative reality. And buying land in these games is now possible. And the most popular areas where people are going to converge in these games, that's going to be possible. I'm, I'm getting ready to get my real estate license. I've never had my real estate license. I was like, ah, why not? You know, I got some friends that are probably listening to this right now. Um, and they were like, oh, you should come join EXP, right? You guys know what EXP has done. They've got that 3D world where you know, you can go in and you can meet with clients and you can chat with people and you can sign deals. You can do all kinds of stuff in this metaverse that they created. That's really all that is. So, you know, what if I needed to do certain things inside of my metaverse, like uh, fight a dragon and I need a special sword to fight this dragon? I got to go down to Rebecca's store in the metaverse and purchase this sword from her with my, my, my cryptocurrency. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of how it works, and I know a lot of us are older. We probably don't. We're like, who the hell is going to do that? There's a lot of people that are going to do that. Well, and I think the way that that applies to us is those that generation is going to be so used to doing that that as soon as this becomes mainstream for what well, what as an old fogey, I'm going to call real investing. They're going to be so prepared to do that and so used to doing that, that it, it will be such an easy transfer for them that it'll go so quickly. Once that opens, once like you and I were talking about the state of Ohio does title searches uh, through, through a blockchain kind of uh, a search, that'll be so simple for them. They'll understand that it'll be so quick. And so investing through this strategy will be second nature to them because they've done it since they were tiny inside that that meta universe yeah oh yeah i see a, a question here what are gas fees that's something i didn't go over it's pretty important so on the ethereum network if you want to do a transaction you have to pay the miners so i'm a i'm an ethereum miner the way i make money is people if they want to do a transaction they have to use my computing power in order to make that happen so they pay me a gas fee all the miners earn money in gas fees. So the network, remember, there is no central authority on that network. It's just a group of computers. And everyone who wants to do anything in that, in that Ethereum network has to, has to incentivize the miners to process those transactions. And that's what gas fees are. Adam, do you know um, if they can do like-kind exchanges into digital land? I don't know, but that'd be awesome. Like a 1031 exchange inside of like... That would be pretty sweet. Well, I didn't even go over like actual mining. I've got a buddy who's got a crypto mine in Kentucky down in Eastern near West Virginia. And this is pretty sweet. So I've got crypto and I'm going to, if I sell it, I'm going to have to pay taxes on it, right? I have to pay long-term, short-term capital gains on it. Well, my buddy just opened a this huge crypto mine in, in 
southeastern Kentucky, and it's in an op zone. So if I send him my crypto, I don't have to pay taxes on it for 10 years, right? I think that's how it works. And then 85%, once that 10 years is up, as long as I hold that investment uh, for that amount of time. But the money I make off mining, no cap gains. Did not even think about that, but we've talked about opportunity zones a lot. And by the way, shout out to Southeastern Kentucky. That's where I'm from. There you go. Um, <laughs> that is an amazing thought because um, those those are open till Charles isn't on the call, but aren't those open till like 2028? I think so. Yeah. So okay. in the equipment, you just have to buy the equipment right now. He uh, he made a deal with Bitmain, which is the largest producer of Bitcoin mining equipment in the world. And a lot of this machinery, a lot of these computers, they aren't made here. There are some places that make them here, but the Southeast Asian countries are much more efficient and they have the equipment to make processors and to make this equipment, which is why Apple sends all of their processors to Taiwan. Taiwan Semiconductor makes a whole bunch of this stuff. So a lot of these machines are made in Asia. So if you want to buy them, you know, right now with the chip shortages and a lot of other stuff, it's, they're very hard to get a hold of. He just bought 10,000 S9s, which are about seven years old. It's older equipment, so they've been used. Um, but he bought them for a really, really good price, around $300 a piece. And if you did a, a Bitcoin mining calculation, if say I put uh, say I put fifty thousand dollars in these machines, I'm going to earn about three times that next year in Bitcoin. And the reason you want to mine versus going on an exchange and buying Bitcoin is so you invest in the equipment. You have to pay the electric fee, which he's getting four point six cents electric right now. So it's going to cost us about eighteen thousand dollars to produce a Bitcoin. So why would I go on an exchange and buy it for fifty thousand dollars when I could produce it for eighteen thousand? Wow. Tax-free. Now, there's an alternate investment. Other More questions. Is investing in Bitcoin cash as good as Bitcoin? No. <laughs> okay. So, so okay, okay. Here's, what, here's what Bitcoin cash is. So, okay, people are always like, oh, there's only 21 million Bitcoin, but you could fork Bitcoin and you could create a brand new network, which is, that's what it's called. It's called forking. So, essentially, you take a the ledger, and you create a new copy of the ledger and call it something completely different, which is what Bitcoin Cash did. So some of the developers, some of the miners for Bitcoin said, Bitcoin's not fast enough. We want to create a new network, call it Bitcoin Cash, and you just copy the ledger. So Bitcoin Cash, up until, when, when it, and up until it started, as soon as they forked it over, they made a copy, they have the exact same history as Bitcoin. But now they have a new because they had to bring some of the miners over with them to mine Bitcoin cash. So every time you fork it, you also need to get the miners, some of those miners to come over with you. Otherwise, nobody's going to adopt it. Bitcoin cash does have pretty good adoption. Is it Bitcoin? No. It's like a bootleg Bitcoin. But it is fast. But the thing is, is you've got more developers. You've got more miners on the Bitcoin network. So the Bitcoin network is older. It's got a better brand. It's got more miners, and they're creating the, the Lightning Network. So it's got more developers trying to help upgrade it. And these developers are just doing it because they want to do it, right? Because um, it's open source software. Adam, somehow you just went you just went to mute, sir. There's a button somewhere. There it is. Oh, I don't know how that even happened. Maybe <laughs> maybe this software was sick of hearing me. Um, so uh, so yeah so. It's it's Bitcoin, but it's like the Big Lots version of Bitcoin. So that's what it is. Next question. Is there any guarantee that Bitcoin will not be closed down other than the 70 million computers, which didn't work out in the case of Libra or Facebook? Well, Libra is centralized. So there's one organization that can go and testify. Congress can call Mark Zuckerberg in and say, what's this Libra stuff you're doing? Because he he's it's a centralized blockchain. There is no CEO of Bitcoin. There's nobody you can call in. It's just a big network of computers that are just running. So there's no, there's no person attached to that. So what Libra was trying to do is create a money system, a monetary system inside of Facebook, which would totally make sense because I could take if, – if Facebook created a payment wallet like a PayPal, I could go anywhere on the planet that accepted Libra coin and use that instead of converting my U.S. dollars into Spanish lira or whatever, or euro or whatever. 
So it, it made sense, but nobody in the crypto community wants Mark Zuckerberger to control a cryptocurrency. I would agree to that. Yeah, you shouldn't uh, have centralized cryptocurrencies. So China has a centralized cryptocurrency. So they, they have a digital yuan, which they distributed to millions and millions of people that are using it like regular paper money inside, but it's centralized. So the, the, the scary thing about that is if China decides that you don't have enough social points, they can just shut off your digital wallet. You don't have cash. They just shut you down. Can't do that with Bitcoin. Uh, someone in the chat bar, said, chat bar said, I lease space to a miner, industrial zoning near his home so he can run heavy electrical uh, service. That was an interesting new, uh, new development for them. Also, question, and I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, so Joe, help me out if I miss it here, but between blockchain, electric vehicles, et cetera, where is, this, where is the world going to get the necessary electric, uh, electrical network to be able to make all of this happen? I would argue that the next big transformation in renewable energy is going to come out of the crypto space because I'm financially motivated to reduce my energy costs. Like, do I want to be paying for dirty coal? to run my Bitcoin mine? No, because it's expensive. I mean, it's cheap, you know, relatively, but I'd much rather be using uh, solar, wind, some renewable that I don't have to pay, you know, nine cents a kilowatt hour to, to create. Now in the state of Kentucky, state of Kentucky is actually the second largest miner in the country. Texas is number one. And we give tax credits, by the way. We get tax credits. Kentucky yes. gets tax credits for, for minors. Of all the states, I was so proud. I'm like, we're so behind in everything else, but at least we're forward thinking here. That's right. Well, I'm on a committee that was formed by Senator Brandon Smith out of Hazard. And, you know, he had me come down there, testify three times with a buddy of mine. And we got a some legislation passed. They, they funded a, um, a team of people, of regular citizens like me, who researched how blockchain could potentially transform a lot of the industries in the state of Kentucky. When you think of logistics, blockchain's awesome. And you guys could look it up. I mean, just look up how blockchains will transform logistics. It's awesome. Uh, the power grid, making it more secure so we don't get an attack. If somebody attacks you know, a power grid in, in America right now on a centralized computer, they hack that one computer, power grid goes down, right? We need to decentralize that. So you've got things like that that we did. But another thing he did, was he made it to where um, if you have a Bitcoin mine, you don't have to pay taxes on the electric. So it reduces the electric costs. And another cool thing they want to do is take the heat from the mines, from the crypto mine, pump it into the old coal mines and grow mycelium mushroom, which if you've ever gotten your little container to put your drinks in at McDonald's, that's actually mushroom. That's a mushroom. That's mycelium mushroom. Or... Cybacillin, I think that's what it's called, cybacillin, which is used to treat PTSD and drug addiction. So imagine the coal miners down in eastern Kentucky who don't have jobs anymore, but aren't afraid to go down their mines. Now they're mining crypto and growing mushroom. You just created a brand new industry. Speaking from someone who lived in a, uh, a town that thrived on coal mining, I'm all about it. That, that would be amazing. A couple more questions, sir. Where can I go to learn more and eventually set up my own machine? So there's YouTube channels. I mean, it's it's crazy how much you could learn on YouTube. I mean, I, I'm i kind of a, I guess my Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENTP, so I just go down the rabbit hole on stuff too much. And I will literally sit in my computer in the middle of the night, and I'll be up till three in the morning watching videos on all this stuff. YouTube is probably the best place to just type in whatever you want to search for. And there are tons of videos. Um, there's a guy who mines crypto. He has a really good channel. It's Vosk Coin, V-O-S-K, I believe, is the name of his channel, Vosk Coin. And he's just a guy with a, with a garage that mines crypto. And uh, he's built, you can just watch the progression over time. He's just gaining more and more and more miners over time. But he's pretty knowledgeable. I like watching his stuff. But YouTube, how to build a miner, how to mine crypto. It's all out there. Joe, I'm trying to figure out how to unmute you, sir. I think Lori might have to do that. I think I'm all on now. Um, and this is an absolutely intriguing conversation and I really appreciate it. I think it's great. But back to my question about electricity. We, I'm a, I'm a lawyer 
We've talked about blockchain. We've talked about it with titles all over the country, all over the world. Um, and when the question comes up, I always ask the question, where's the electricity going to come from? We do not have the generating power now. It gets to 28 degrees in Texas and the grid shuts down. We're building a, a, a Ford plant uh, 35 miles out of Memphis. It's going to have 5,800 employees building nothing but electric um, Ford F-150s. They'll be rolling off the line in two years. Where's the electricity going to come from? We don't have the generating power now. Well, they, they got to hunt it down. Right now, a majority of the, <laughs> a majority of the uh, crypto, so uh, a lot of times it's hydropower. So in China, a majority of the Bitcoin miners, which before China banned mining Bitcoin and then allowed it again like a month later, um, they use a lot of hydroelectric in China to mine the Bitcoin. So I invested, there's a, uh, down in Rockdale, Texas, there was an old Alcoa plant and it had its own power generation like on site. So I invested in a, a mine down there. Now listen to this, listen to these numbers. Okay. So I invested, I don't know, $10,000. I think it was because my buddy was working with these guys down there, helping them get everything set up. $10,000 in six months, they pay me the $10,000 back at 8% interest, gave me stock, which is now worth $180,000. Oh my. Yeah. I invested in that uh, last uh, September, 2020, October. Maybe I sent them the money like November, 2020, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about because here's the thing. They needed the money to purchase the equipment, right? Once they had the equipment, they were making money. It's generating, and they've got one of three warehouses set up. They've got two more they need to build. They're making $2 million a day in Bitcoin, but that's the one that's right next door to the power plant. It's right next door to the old Alcoa plant, right? So people are searching for these old plants and things like that. That's where they're finding the power at right now. So, I mean, you have to have access to that. A buddy of mine, he builds them in rural Georgia right now. He, he's building them. Matter of fact, he's building them for municipalities. So think about this, Hamilton, Ohio, right? He built a, a, a crypto mine in a, in, a, in a shipping container. They had some kind of purchase agreement with the grid where they bought this many megawatts of power. And this, I may be wrong on this, but, but follow me. So they had to buy so many megawatts of power. Well, they were using this much, but they, they were spending on this much that they weren't using because they were expecting a bunch of uh, manufacturing to come in, which never happened. So they're paying for electric that they're not even using. He goes up there. He says, why don't you let me put a, a, a crypto mine in here? We'll use that electric that you're paying for, but you're not using. Now they're making money. Now they're making more money. Like they were losing money before. Now they're making money off that electric they promised to buy. I mean, you've got government agencies, municipalities. You would, it would blow your mind if you knew who was building crypto mines right now. Well, as the gentleman said in the chat earlier, that he, because of his uh, location, he was able to actually have a lease agreement with, with someone for his property because of the location of how close he was to uh, industrial electricity. That's right. They'll find you. If you've got power and you've got land, that's what you need. You need cheap electric and you need land. If you have those things, Literally, my buddy Dan will come down to you and he will put a shipping container, cost about four and a half million dollars to put one of those on your on your land. If you can get the electric rate down to about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour, you'll make that four and a half million dollars back in about four months. And then it'll be all gravy after that. Wow. So every four months, you're making four and a half million dollars. There you go, guys. I mean, this is in theory. This is like actually happening. Like this is really... The money people are making right now, which is why Riot Blockchain, go look at Riot Blockchain's stock chart. Go look what happened to it over the last like two years. I mean, it's gone crazy. It's up like a thousand percent or something insane. Well, as I said before, we're not giving financial advice, but that's that's some pretty amazing. Um, yeah, just numbers. Yeah, yeah, just numbers. Just, you, you figure it out yourselves. <laughs> Um, also, Ed, uh, Ed Lowry also says there's a push to eliminate fossil fuel, including natural gas and using electric. There will be competition. Funneling the heat from machines would work during the winter to heat a building as well. Yes, yes, exactly, Ed. And also, um, if you go to Colorado, the crypto mines there are actually pumping the heat into grow facilities for marijuana. So they're actually using the heat to, and, you know, I mean, it's cold in Denver, right? So they're just pumping that heat right into there, just same way they're talking about doing the mines in Kentucky. So, I mean, that, that heat could be reused. 
Um, also, we got some questions about replays. We do post these calls on our YouTube channel. So um, if you um, are curious to go, this is a lot of information. So um, out there then for you to, to be able to revisit. Can we talk, Adam, a little bit about your your most recent project that you've got, the exchange, yeah. and then and then possibly uh, the other thing to cover. I know we don't have a ton of time left, but tokens and real estate and how you see that kind of coming together in the future. Yeah. So the idea of tokenization, and actually I've, I run a podcast called Side Hustle City, and we bring on guests that are in all these different you know industries, and they've figured out ways to make money on the side or whatever. Um, but one of the projects we wanted to do, my my co-host is actually writing a book on tokenization right now. And essentially, say my building here is worth uh, $5 million. If there was an exchange where I could, I could mint 5 million tokens and I could put it on the exchange just like the stock market and shares in my building could trade the same way a stock trades for individual property, not for a REIT. Because if I buy a REIT right now, I, I own what, like a thousand properties in Manhattan and who knows where and you know, I don't know where these properties are, but say I wanted to raise money. I'm, I own this building. It's worth $5 million. I want to get liquid, but I only want to sell a million dollars worth. I don't want to go find a partner or anything like that. I just want to, I want to tokenize the building. I want to sell a million shares, put them on an exchange and investors come in and they buy those million shares. Well, I talked a little bit about smart contracts, right? So every token holder, every wallet owns a certain amount of tokens. Now, if this building is making money, I could redistribute automatically all the dividends that this building is paying to all those shareholders like that. Just boom. And all the accounting is there. Like everything is in real time, essentially. So the price of the token could also be tied to cap rate so that you don't have these like wild swings in the price of the token. So that's essentially what we do. And it's, it's, it's in a way it's to help uh, investors get liquid in any way they want. I could sell 1.1 million tokens if I wanted to, if I needed to take that cash and then go do something with it. And also, if my tenants are paying me in cash, I could take my the, the, the additional tokens, my $4 million worth of tokens, and I could just redistribute to all the other token holders additional ownership tokens, and I could keep the cash and go do whatever I want to do with the cash. So it takes the syndication process that has been terrible yeah. To get through for for a real estate investor for years and you could raise money for projects you're right you could syndicate it you could create syndications you could say hey you know the lady who gets gentrified out of her neighborhood you know i mean everybody's heard from you know the people that god oh, gentrification is bad real estate investors are evil they're here to take all of our land so what if that person who is getting gentrified out of her neighborhood could invest in the project what if she could then, in, instead of just being kicked out of her neighborhood or kicked out of whatever, what if she could buy $500 worth of tokens in that building, in that project, and make dividends, make 11% on that every year? That's the option. You know, you're, you're, you're crowdfunding, essentially, these development projects, but making them open to everybody. So that's, that's another alternative. And now I've got, instead of these REITs that have thousands of properties, I could go and purchase packages or I could have in my my digital wallet properties in my local neighborhood and anytime I wanted to sell them put them up on the exchange boom sell them so there you go but but the whole idea is the title would be in a in a some kind of a trust or some kind of so the title is owned by you know a special purpose vehicle and then everyone who owns tokens owns whatever percentage of tokens they have in the trust so you don't, you're not going to have title like moving back and forth all the time. That would be amazing. Yeah. Well, that's what we're working on. The biggest problem is liquidity. So you have to have a lot of investors. You've got to have a lot of money in that system so that there's volume. Because if I buy some of those shares, I want to know that I can sell them. You know, if I just invite a bunch of people into to my syndication and I'm like, hey, guys, we're selling shares. And then that's it. Now you got these shares and then we don't keep up with it and we don't you know, you don't have more people coming in to buy those shares, then, you know, you're stuck with these shares you can't sell. So that's, that's the biggest problem. And that's, you know, once again, uh, as, as tokenization becomes more popular and these kinds of concepts become more popular, we're well positioned to take advantage of that. That's super exciting. And so that's what your exchange is building mm -hmm. 
to yep. be. To it's already built. Like yep. It's already yes. built. Yeah. We're just trying to work with a bank in Liechtenstein to get all their, their wealthy investors to throw some money in it. So that's, that's what we're waiting on. <laughs> Very cool. Um, can we revisit the, the thought of inheritance? So um, both the Bitcoin that you own and the mine that you have, what, what does inheritance look like with that? Some of us are at a point that we, we are concerned about that. We don't know, you know, anything can happen, right? And we'd like to know that these assets that we're buying since kind of new to us, yeah. uh, how, how does that work? So Bitcoin and cri the crypto world in general has gotten, it's, it's progressed pretty well, I'd say, um, over the last few years since I've been messing around with it. But I mean, it was the Wild West back in 15, 16. And before that, it was even worse, right? So you have to remember your private key, right? You have to be able to get into it. So a lot of people, they won't keep their crypto on an exchange. They won't keep it on Gemini or Coinbase. They'll put it on what's called a digital wallet. So they'll have a hardware wallet like a Ledger or a Trezor, T-R-E-Z-O-R. -E and essentially what that is, it's a little device, a, a USB device that connects into your computer, that then connects to the blockchain, and you have your crypto on that. And it's really, really, I mean, it's impossible to, to crack, right? Um, so a lot of people will keep their crypto on that and then let their loved ones know or keep a paper record of what that private key is. And generally, people will have two copies of that private key. And you don't want to keep your private key as a digital thing on your computer because if your computer ever gets hacked, Boom, now they got your private key. People will literally just print out those 12 words that make up their private key, have one in like a safety deposit box so that if something is to happen, then your, your loved ones or whoever uh, next to kin have access to, uh, to your accounts. Um, but you could also give them your you know, Coinbase password. If you don't have 2FA or something set up that requires like face ID or any of that kind of stuff, um, they have access to your accounts that way too. For those who want to get started, they want to dip their toe in the water somehow. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest not giving financial advice, but how are some of the ways that they might be able to do that? I would, I would just go and download either Coinbase or Gemini and put in all your information. They're going to ask, they're going to do the whole KYC process, know your customer process, right? In AML, the any money laundering stuff. And you go in there and just download one of those connect your bank account. And now you've got exposure, put some money in there, whatever you're comfortable putting in there, whatever you can afford to lose is what everybody always says in the crypto world, put in what you can afford to lose. Personally, I don't think it's going to zero. So I, I think you're fine. But if you want to put some money in there, coin, cryptos, Bitcoin's been around 13 years now, and it's done nothing but go up in value over time, because what does the US dollar do? Go down in value over time. So, and I always tell people, your house doesn't necessarily go up in value. Inflation, the dollar goes down in value. And, and it costs more money for lumber as time goes on. It costs more money for drywall. It costs more money for subfloor. It costs more money for this and that, roofing tiles. All that stuff goes up because inflation goes up. So, if it costs more money to build a house, even the, the, the existing homes are going to go up in value because the replacement cost of the home is going to go up in value. So, inflation drives the price of real estate. So it, it drives the price of Bitcoin too, because Bitcoin is, has a stable, it has a fixed asset. There's only so many homes in the world, right? So it gives it kind of its price. Or there's only so many Bitcoin in the world, but you keep printing money. There's more money supply all the time. Now they're going to print their two and a half trillion dollars worth. So what do you think that's going to do with the price of Bitcoin? So long-term, I'm bullish on Bitcoin personally, and I've got, uh, uh, I've got investments in Bitcoin and I keep them secure, but um, Coinbase, go on there and take a look in, in, or Gemini. I can go on my Gemini app right now and I can filter by different things. If I want to buy metaverse coins, you know, investments, um, associated with the metaverse, I just click on the metaverse tab and it filters all the available tokens by just the metaverse projects or the DeFi projects, which is really exciting to me. The whole DeFi space is awesome. It's like no bank, you know, we lend to each other. Um, it's, it's a really, really cool thing. So if anybody wanted to look up decentralized finance and just study that a little bit, that would be, I think that is probably one of the more legit, um, projects coming out of this whole cryptocurrency digital asset world. Awesome. So, um, just a note, 
if you think that you're going to be investing in crypto so that you're not having to pay taxes, that's not true. Well, no, they'll find you. <laughs> yes, the IRS will will uh, will find you. Um, so make sure that you keep that in mind. But I know um, my son is basically half of everything that he's doing of his savings is all going into uh, digital assets, and um, it has seen, of course. Ridden, ridden the roller coaster over the last little bit, but um, he he certainly believes that he and his peer group this is this is where everything's going. So in that twenty to thirty uh, twenty to thirty year old kind of age group, they're getting a tremendous comfort level here and will be investing in this uh, as time goes on. More listen to your more. kids. Listen to the kids. If you want to invest in this space. Ask your kids because we're too old and we have too many responsibilities, guys. We can't sit around and just, you know, dance around Discord all day and get on Telegram channels and Twitter. Like we got work to do, right? So your kids are, they're, they're sitting here chatting with their friends. They're going to school talking about this. They're, they're deep in this world. So if anybody knows anything, it's probably not me. It's probably your kids. They probably know a whole lot more than I do. Well, the future's coming. So as we said, I asked Adam, I said, you know, are we two, five or 10 years uh, with this technology or, or, you know, or maybe not even our lifetimes with this technology being uh, immediately available in terms of title searches, in terms of buying uh, real estate with, uh, with some kind of digital coin, crypto. And your answer, sir? Yeah. I mean, we're, it's there. I mean, we're, we're, we're here. We're every, like, it's happening right now. And somebody just put here in the chat, can I buy $100 worth of easy peasy? Yep, $100 worth, no problem. I could go into my Gemini account right now, open it up, pick a cryptocurrency I want to buy, boom, $100, sure. Right out of my bank account. Usually takes three to four days on Gemini and I think Coinbase too for the money to come out of your bank account. So you can actually, they'll pre-credit you the crypto uh, if you buy it right now and then you got three days to get your money in the bank. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's here. It's here. I mean, you guys, you know, seen the presentation, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions or whatever after this, if, if someone wants to shoot me an email, I mean, I already think I get like a thousand emails a day, but my secretary is going to go crazy trying to go through my emails. But yeah, I mean, if anybody, or maybe they send some stuff to you guys, but yeah, happy to answer questions, but I'm telling you, YouTube, it's, it's a source of information for everything. So good. One other quick question. Quick question. Uh, by the way, there's uh, several thank yous in the chat bar to you. Yeah. But is this something they can um, purchase on TradeStation or Robinhood? So Robinhood and I think TradeStation, essentially you don't really own your crypto. So you can't pull that crypto off of Robinhood and put it onto a digital wallet. That's there's, You're essentially trading kind of like a derivative of Bitcoin on Robinhood. So probably not the greatest place to be trading. And also Robinhood uh, goes down sometimes on purpose um, because, you know, things like Dogecoin or one of these things, they start dropping in value. Everybody's trying to sell and they just shut their system down. So that's, that's an issue. So I would say if you want to really own your Bitcoin, you could, uh, you could take your bank account, connect it to a Coinbase or a Gemini, purchase it there and then transfer it to a digital wallet stick it in cold storage, put it in a safety deposit box, and then come back 10 years and see what it's worth. I got a buddy who's got $80 million on a hard drive that he cryptographed himself out of in 2013. Yeah, he was learning cryptography and he went on vacation for four days and he had a 200-word password. And it automatically reshuffles every day. And he has to take, he would take a paper, he would actually print it out so he knew what his password was. Every day it would change. And he forgot about it. He went on vacation. And he was mining Bitcoin back in 2013. So that Bitcoin would right now be worth about $80 million. So that's a big bummer. Oh. So just remember your private key. If anything, just remember your private key. If you take it off of an exchange, you got to remember that private key. And then just really quickly, a question about who's ahead of us in, in using digital assets. I put in the chat bar earlier, El Salvador has adopted it as their 100 100%. And you want to talk about uh, sustainable mining. They're using um, hydro or they're using um, uh, whatever the power is called from a volcano, like essentially the heat from the volcano to produce energy and, and do crypto mining. So they gave every citizen in El Salvador $30 worth of Bitcoin. And I think they're up like 30 or 40% now at this point. And that wasn't very long ago. So they, they, 
they made it a an official currency in El Salvador. So people, every retailer in El Salvador has to be able to accept Bitcoin as a payment, a form of payment. And now they're creating a crypto city on the water, like next to the volcano, and there's zero taxes, no cap gains, and they're trying to attract this crypto community to come live down there. And they're, it, Miami, the mayor of Miami, go look at what the mayor of Miami has been doing. I mean, there's a lot happening right now. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's moving fast. It's moving. Puerto Rico. My buddy just got back from Puerto Rico. Tons of mi crypto millionaires moving down to Puerto Rico because it's a, uh, what is it, 4% flat tax in Puerto Rico and zero cap gains tax. So now you got tons of these people in the crypto community that are going down there because they trade, right? And they don't want to have to pay those cap gains. So they go down there and they, they live in Puerto Rico. You know, six months in a day, you live in Puerto Rico, you're a Puerto Rican citizen, and you're still an American. So that's what they're doing. So this isn't just driving like a financial thing. This is literally changing the way people live their lives and where they live. They're choosing to move to places that are more progressive thinking about the crypto space. Well, State of Kentucky. With the great migrations that are happening, uh, once people learn that they could be remote with their work with COVID, could be a huge reshuffling. Oh, yeah. Population wise, which, by the way, will affect us as investors, people. That's don't kid ourselves that all, all of these things that are happening are not, it's not going to cause fallout in, in real estate market, whether you're playing in the crypto space or not. Oh, you want to make some money, go to some of these places where they're selling real estate right now to crypto investors. I mean, there's literally billionaires. That, are, that got in really early in the cryptos and they're moving to these places. They're going to Puerto Rico. They're going to El Salvador. They're going to some of these countries that are more accepting. Um, Singapore, right? They're going to these places. That's where they want to buy property. I know the lady, she was the first realtor to ever figure out how to use Bitcoin to purchase a property. And it was in Malibu. And I was actually at a real estate conference in Vegas. And I saw her and I'm like, oh my God, what's up? And the guy that was trying to buy this house in Malibu, by the time they figured out how to make the purchase go through, the Bitcoin had gone up so much, he used the extra money to buy a Lambo for his house in Malibu. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. So there you go. And now he's probably looking at that house like, why did I use my Bitcoin? I should have just kept my Bitcoin. This was, you know, five years ago or something. I should have just held on to the Bitcoin and just bought the house with cash. Absolutely. Well, Adam, we really appreciate you. We're, we're over time, but people were chiming in so much i didn't want to to shut down the discussion but i see tim shouting out eastern kentucky there absolutely appalachia yes sir um i i too by the way have prop just just fyi i have property in southeastern kentucky so there you go we need to bring some <laughs> economy there, we need to bring something to yeah that that part of the country needs some needs some uh bitcoin activity happening down there so absolutely well we really appreciate you adam thank you so much um, if people want to find you and listen to the podcast or find out what you're doing and follow you, how will they do that? Yeah. So the podcast is uh, Side Hustle City. So it's on pretty much every podcasting platform there is, Apple Podcasts, you know, Stitcher, all those guys. Or you can just go to the website. It's sidehustle.money. So www.sidehustle.money. And then you can also find me on LinkedIn. You want to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with you guys. I'm all over the country. I'm barely ever here. So I'll probably be floating around. I'm, I'm going down to Dallas for that Bearcats game. Go Bearcats. Go Bearcats. Um, yeah, so I'll be down there, uh, you know, during that whole time. So, but yeah, I mean, if anybody ever wants to, you know, I'm out of town or something, you want to meet up, happy to, happy to meet up and sit down and chat more with you. And last question, uh, lots of interest in your um, exchange. Oh, C, yeah, cprop.io cprop.io so if they want to be uh informed about when that is available for investing in they can yeah there's a newsletter sign up on the on the site there so any any news that we have we're going to put out on the on the newsletter there and we don't spam you i mean there's not it's not super frequent so you, you're not going to have your inbox full of cprop email so you'll be fine well, we appreciate that. A couple things. One, you'll be able to find this on uh, YouTube for the replay. Uh, we're going to ask Adam if he would share that great deck that he, slide deck that he had in the beginning, and we will send that out to all of those of you who have registered. And this has been such a hot topic. We're going to continue this discussion in the National RIA community. So if you go to the National RIA website, nationalria.org, 
and you click inside the community, we will, um, as we close this out, we'll start a discussion group where you can continue this discussion uh, there online as well. So thank you so much for today. As we said in the beginning, uh, happy holidays, just a little bit early. Thank yeah. you for using your time to, to share with us and um, be in our community. And we will see you next month. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much.